Uh, uh, first, uh, hello everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Um uh, for giving me this chance. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to introduce how we can use uh, mathematics to understand complex biological systems. Uh, maybe, as far as I know, first mathematical model of the biology will be Fibonacci sequence, uh, which try to quantify the rabbit growth. I guess you learned this at, I think, high school. And uh, sort of long term, uh, I think the longest interaction between math and biology might be this question, how does our brain work? Uh, indeed, about 200 years ago, this William uh, Helmholtz tried to find the energy function uh, to describe the brain, uh, brain dynamics. Uh, another important pioneer work is done by Alan Turing. Uh, uh, he published this paper just two years before his uh, unfortunate death. Uh, in this paper, he tried to answer how such a variety patterns can be possible in nature uh, by using this uh, reaction diffusion uh, partial differential equation. Uh, here is the sort of simulation reserved from this equation and kind of uh, corresponding po uh, pattern which exists in real nature. So as you can see at these three uh, pioneer example of mathematical biology, the aim of the mathematical biology is uh, mathematical representation by using some equation uh, for the biological process. So by doing this, uh, we want to test whether the vague idea of biologists really work or not. And second, uh, we want to make some prediction which can guide the experiment of the, uh, bio in the biology lab. So uh, kind of, as you can see, uh, mathematical history of the mathematical biology is longer than uh, our expectation. But only recently it got lots of attention. Uh, the reason is uh, it relates with the history of the biology. So here are five important revolutions along the biology history. So the first revolution uh, occurred by, uh, with the invention of the microscope. And then second invention is done by Lin, uh, Linnae's uh, taxonomy, which classified uh, uh, animals and organisms. In the high school, I, I guess you remember that Jong Sok Kang Mu, blah, 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 yeah. And uh, third evolution is done by Darwin's, which who published this, The Origin of Species. And fourth evolution is done by Mendel's, who uh, developed this law of inheritance. And fifth, most recent, recent revolution is done by Watson and Crick, who identified the DNA structure. So the common feature of this whole revolution is uh, done by one brilliant biologist with their brilliant intuition. Okay, so after this Watson Crick's uh, DNA identification, uh, what happened last 50 years in biology is uh, this revolution of the molecular biology happened. What this means is now for the last 50 years, biologists try to look at the inside of the cell in the molecular level. So they collected a lot of data for the last 50 years. So what they realize is biological system is way, way more complex than their expectation. So now they realize that they cannot use classical approach. They cannot use brilliant one person's idea to understand this complex system. So now they uh, pay attention to the math. So many people say that sixth revolution of biology is the combination of math and biology. So they now admit that they need a mathematician to understand this complex uh, system. And that's what I want to show uh, today. So how this uh, collaboration between mathematician and biologist uh, happen is typical process is this circle, uh, which briefly, uh, which consists of these five steps. And today I'm gonna talk about each step, and then I will show some example. Uh, so let me begin with the problem identification process. So the first step of the collaboration is finding a good problem. Now what is a good problem in mathematical biology? So in math, the good problem is a conjecture, I guess, right? It will give you some 
feels metal. <laughs> but in mathematical biology, group problem is not the conjecture. It's an intersection between these two circles. It should be biologically interesting problem, and it should be tractable with the current mathematics. This is a good problem. Uh, for instance, Turing pattern. The pattern formation, biologists has no idea what's going in here. So it was definitely an uh, interesting problem to biologists, and it was sort of a conjecture to biologists. Uh, furthermore, reaction diffusion equation, it's a sort of simple PDE. So it's a really mathematically tractable problem. So it satisfied both conditions. So definitely, it was a very interesting uh, problem in mathematical biology. Uh, but as you can see, to find a good problem in the mathematical biology require knowledge of both biology and mathematics. So that's why usually it's, uh, this part is the hardest part of the collaboration, finding a good problem. And another, uh, so here I also emphasize another thing. Uh, as you know, this collaboration will uh, increase our understanding of complex biological system. But not only that, uh, it also uh, stimulates the development of the new mathematics because look at this part. There is a biologically interesting part. But there is still many problems we cannot help because we don't have any tool. So this stimulates the development of new mathematics. So mathematical biology can stimulate the grow, growth of the both field. Okay? Uh, so after finding a good problem, next step is uh, mathematical representation of the biological system. So let me give a simple example. Uh, let's say we have uh, two molecules. I named it blue and red. And here we have three different biochemical reactions. Uh, this K1, K2, K3 are, we say, parameter, which describe how fast these three reactions occur. Okay? So, and here is the ordinary differential equation which describe these biochemical reactions. Okay? So, by solving this ordinary differential equation, what we can do is we can predict how these two species concentration change throughout the time. So it predicts that it will oscillating, okay? But this is an ordinary differential equation. So what is an ordinary differential equation? It assumes that every species distributed in the space in a homogeneous way, right? But that's not true in the real cell. So if we have interest in the spathier distribution of the species, then we can use, an, we have another option, right? So PDE. So by adding this uh, diffusion term, now we can see how this blue and red species distribute uh, in homogeneous way in inside of the cell. Uh, so this is a pretty good uh, way to represent the biological system, but still not realistic. The reason is these two are deterministic system. But inside of cell is not the deterministic. There are always randomness and noise. So it's a stochastic system. So cells today and tomorrow are totally different, okay? So to capture that uh, noise or stochasticity, we can use a chemical master equation. So what is this chemical master equation is? The solution of this chemical master equation is the, here the solution was a concentration, but here the solution is a probability of the state. So probability of the, the number of the blue species and number of R species we become 10. So it only gives us a probability, not the exact number. So by simulating or solving this chemical master equation, we can get this kind of result. As you can see, there is a, some fluctuation and noise. Okay? So th in this way, we can capture the stochasticity in the system. And finally, uh, if we have interest in both stochasticity and spathier distribution, then we can use a stochastic partial differential equation, which can capture both. So you can see the some inhomogeneous in the space and the stochasticity in the system. So th these four are sort of typical way uh, uh, we use to some study the biological system. Uh, so as you can see, uh, if you come to me and if I teach about one week short course, I think you can do this uh, for any system. But then it's so easy, right? But real. Uh, but real research is not such easy. The reason is, I use this simple example, but uh, real cell inside system is here. So this is a 
our knowledge is inside of the cell. So every this dot represents a specific species and the interaction between species. So let's imagine we developed ordinary differential equation for this. There will be about 1,000 variables. Yeah, not easy, right? So we can write it, but not easy problem. So, t so what, but uh, there were smart mathematicians. So they found a way to simplify the, this system. So mainly using the time scale separation. So as I said, there are so many different reactions, right? So that reaction usually occur in the different time scale. That means something are really fast, something are really slow. So due to this time scale separation, uh, we can categorize a species as a fast species or slow species. If reaction which changing the concentration of species is fast, then we call it's a fast species. So in the presence of such fast and slow species, uh, typical dynamics can be uh, described by this uh, simple diagram. So here, x-axis represents the slow species concentration, and y-axis is a fast species concentration, okay? So let's say this uh, uh, star represents the initial condition of the system. Then what typically happens is, from here, the solution quickly approach, very quickly approach it to this slow manifold or quasi-steady state of the system. So this is really fast, and then both slow and fast species change slowly along this slow manifold. So this dynamics is really fast, and this is slow. So what this means is, let's, let's say we are doing the, some experiment, and we will observe the dynamics of the system. That observed dynamics will be this or this. What is a reasonable guess? Slow. Yeah, it's slow. Because this is so fast, we rarely see it. So that means the interesting dynamics we have is dynamics along this slow manifold. This is really good news for us because original uh, uh, dynamics occur in the two-dimensional space, let's say. But the dynamics we have interesting occur along this one dimensional slow manifold. So we can reduce the uh, dimension of the system. How? By projecting the dynamics along this slow manifold. So from now, I will call this is a slow manifold. And the way to project the uh, system to this slow manifold is known as uh, singular perturbation theory or uh, quasi-steady state approximation in the math biology field. Okay, it has two different names, but basically uh, same thing. So let me explain what is that uh, with this simple example. Uh, if you take any biochemistry uh, class, uh, in the first class you will learn this uh, system. It is a uh, known as Michels Mantin enzyme kinetics. Uh, yeah, see some. Yeah, this is sort of bio 101 diagram. So in this system, enzyme binds a substrate to form the complex, and this complex uh, dissociates to the enzyme and product. Basically, this enzyme converts this substrate to the new pro protein uh, P. So this is how enzyme working. Uh, so that's why when we eat something, it changes to the, some different molecules so that it can be used as energy. Okay. So, and there are three different reactions, and here are ordinary differential equations. And let's assume that this binding and unbinding are really fast. And this is typical. This usually binding and unbinding really occur faster in the uh, biochemical system. Then what happens is then this uh, complex variable becomes really fast species. Okay, that means it will reach it to the slow manifold or quasi-steady state very quickly. Then how can we calculate the slow manifold? It's really easy. So let's go back to our ordinary differential equation class. So when you calculate the steady state of the system, how can you do it? Set the left side of the differential equations are zero, right? Because e everything will reach the steady state. But to calculate the quasi-steady state, uh, same, but we just set the left side of this fast differential equation is zero. Uh, then. If we set here is zero, then we'll get the algebraic equation, right? So by solving this algebraic equation, we can get this michels mantin equation, which it describes the C in terms of the slow variable S. Okay? 
And this equation describes the slow manifold of system. That is, this equation tells when slow species S is given, what will be the fastest species in the slow manifold. Good? And by plugging, substituting this uh, equation to the C variable, then we can eliminate the C, so we will get this uh, reduced system. So we don't have a C anymore because C is now depending on, C is completely determined by S by using this equation so we can reduce the one dimension. So this system has a couple of advantages. First, low dimension, so analysis become way much easier. Second, I said these two are a uh, fast parameter, that means large number. So it slow down the simulation. But in this reduced system, we don't have any of these two parameters. That means it speed up the simulation a lot. Okay? Uh, finally, uh, very accurate. Okay? Here is a, a solid line is this uh, simulation and this is a, a triangle. So, uh, for instance, uh, speed up by 10 to the 6, but accuracy is almost the same. So let's assume that you can graduate 10 to the 6 times faster. Which one do you want to go? Of course, here, right? So in this way, uh, this, uh, due to this reason, this was the mo uh, this deterministic quasi-steady state approximation is sort of the most uh, widely used tool in the mathematical biology. If you take any, uh, look at any math bio book, uh, first or second chapter will talk about this approach. Uh, but I said that, but this is a deterministic system, right? But real cell is a stochastic system. So then my question was, uh, for given this uh, deterministic system, uh, there is a simple way we can change it to the chemical master equation, which can capture the stochasticity. But my question is, if we change this system to the chemical master equation, let's change this reduced system to the chemical master equation, then it will give the stochastic solution, right? Are these two stochastic solution will be similar or very different? That means, can we use this deterministic reduced system for the stochastic simulation? So, this deterministic reduced system is good for stochastic simulation or not? This is really sort of natural question, right? This is done by all our uh, first generation of the mathematical biologist. Then our Recently, we usually use a stochastic system. Then, natural question is, this is good for stochastic simulation. So regarding this question, uh, early 2000, there were uh, a lot of positive results, which shows that as long as deterministically accurate, when we use this reduced system for stochastic simulation, the accuracies were really good. As you can see there, you cannot distinguish the fluctuation range and uh, distribution of this uh, two systems are almost the same. So due to this positive result, more than 100 published papers use this approach. And there were really some good paper, as you can see, and there was sort of not good paper, which is done by me uh, when I was a graduate student. So because all our famous people use this approach, so I was a poor graduate student, so what else? So I believed them. Uh, but I found that this approach has not been validated. They just used it because it works at a couple important example. And unfortunately, recently, a uh, couple counter example <laughs> identified. So recent papers show that even though deterministically good, when they perform the stochastic simulation, it gave a totally different fluctuation. Yeah, it was sort of doomed to mathematical biology field because that means our all these hundreds good paper can be totally wrong. So, but what we know is this approach sometimes working, sometimes does not work. That's our knowledge. Then what is the natural question? When this is good, right? So, yeah, this is what I had in my mind in the, my postdoc. So I performed some research, and that's what I want to talk uh, briefly from now. So to answer this question, uh, we have to know this fact. As I said, uh, that Michelson-Menten equation described the slow manifold of the deterministic system. 
What is then a slow manifold or quasi-steady state of the stochastic system? It's just a conditional average value of the fast variable given slow variable. So when slow variable is given, the, we can calculate the average of the fast variable. So in stochastic system, this fast variable quickly uh, equilibrate to this conditional average value because it moves very quickly. Let's say you toss the toy, toy million times per second. What do you expect? It will approach to the average probability, right? So in that property, it will quickly approach it to conditional average value. And for given this slow species, it will determine the fast variable value. So then what this means is, here is a full chemical master equation, uh, which we cannot solve at this point. Uh, but by plugging this uh, conditional average value to here, we can simplify this chemical master equation. So this is, we can solve it. But there is a problem. Uh, when we calculate the michaels menten equation, what we did, we set the left side of the algebraic equation zero and then solve it. It was a middle school math, right? But to calculate this conditional average value, we have to know this conditional probability which usually require the solution of the full chemical master equation. So, because we cannot solve it, we want to simplify it. To simplify, we have to know the solution of this. So you can see this uh, circular phenomenon, right? So, so then what people have done is, they use a plan B. They use some assumptions. What they did is, they approximate this conditional average value with this michaels menten equation. That means they assume that slow manifold of the deterministic system and stochastic system might be similar. Because slow manifold of stochastic system is average, so it was sort of reasonable assumption. So this is assumption uh, when people use this deterministic reduced system for the stochastic simulation. So that means the accuracy of uh, determ uh, the stochastic quasi-steady state approximation approach depends on this approximation. This is really good thing or bad thing, right? So what I did is I calculated really the difference between these two. And here is a summary of the theorem. So left side is a, a stochastic slow manifold. And here is a deterministic slow manifold. And here is adder term. So first adder term consists of the final factor. This is a variation of the fast variable. This is average of the fast variable. So what I know, yeah, this is an unfamiliar term, but what this basically what this final factor tells us is how much this fast variable fluctuating. If this is number is large, that means it fluctuating a lot. Zero, that means no fluctuation. So what this tells us, if final factor is zero, there is no error. This is trivial because if final factor is zero, then fast variable does not fluctuating. That means it behaves exactly like a deterministic system, right? So there should be no error. Uh, but in real system, always final factor is not zero because our cell is stochastic system. Then the key point of actually this point is, okay, we cannot avoid this term. But this adder, the presence of this final factor, uh, the adder comes from this uh, final factor is magnified by the derivative of michaels menten equation. Okay. So this is a michaels menten equation, the slow manifolds of the deterministic system. Uh, what this theorem tells us, if this derivative is small, then we are okay. Large, then we will see this problem. So this gives a sort of first condition uh, to use uh, this uh, uh, deterministic <coughs> reduction for the uh, stochastic uh, simulation. Uh, but I done this for a couple uh, popular example of the biological uh, mathematical <coughs> biology. Not it was not the general research. So uh, I had a kept, uh, kept working regarding this. Uh, my uh, my recent work uh, find a little bit more general research. Uh, I don't know uh, you are familiar with the, the singular perturbation theory or not. Uh, these two are sort of classical singular perturbation theory of the deterministic system. Uh, one is a Tikhon of the standard reduction, and this is a generalized Tikhon of Fenichel's reduction. And my recent work sh uh, uh, shows that uh, this Tikhon of standard reduction can read an accurate stochastic reduction, but not this generalized reduction. So, but, uh, but still, 
uh, we show this for some fairly good uh, classes of the uh, system, but still it's ongoing project. But I strongly believe that this is really true for any stochastic system. And uh, I don't know, yeah, if you have an interest in it, please come. We can work together. Uh, OK, so until now, uh, I have discussed that there are various ways to uh, represent the biological system. And as I say, simplification is sort of essential to do something. And next step is a parameter estimation. OK, so what is a parameter is this number. So this number tells how much this uh, reaction occur fast, okay, how fast. So if we can measure this number with experiment, we are done. But unfortunately, 99% we cannot measure it. OK, so we have to do some reasonable guess. Uh, here, you can see the advantage of the reduced reduction. What is the advantage? There are a lot of the parameters we have to estimate, but here are just two. So by doing the reduction, we can reduce the number of the parameter to estimate. That is one of the advantages. Then how can we estimate or guess these parameters? Uh, the most reasonable way is compare the solution of this differential equation with the data. And we try to find the parameter which gives the least error. So this is a typical way people uh, use to estimate the unknown parameter. And then to do this, uh, there are various type of the optimization algorithm uh, have been developed and used. Okay. And uh, so here are some typical way people do. So let's say here are two oscillating time course data. Let's say assume that this is a, a experimental data. And we have some model. This is sort of typical format of the model, which consists of production term and degradation term. Uh, we want to fit this model to this data. Uh, to be frankly, what many people do is, uh, because we have no idea about this function, they begin with the most simple case. Let's say the simple case will be the linear equation. So we have a two parameter. So we try to uh, find the two parameter which can make the solution of this equation are exactly the same with this. Uh, do you think we can do it every time? Yeah, unfortunately, no. If we yes, then it would be easy life. But uh, in most cases, we can't. Then what people do is, let's do the plan B. Let's increase the complexity of the model. So now we have more free parameters. So here we have only two, but now we have a lot. OK, rather than linear equation, let's use the polynomial equation. So, and we spend a couple months with a computer and try to fit. If we fail, let's go to plan C. <laughs> so now let's use a rational function. Uh, kind of, actually due to this polynomial and rational function, uh, there is something algebraic geometry people can do in this field, actually. So. Then, but people, I don't know, people believe that as long as they're increasing this parameter, someday they will find a good parameter. That's sort of common belief. Actually, this common belief actually came from this uh, famous quote of this von Neumann. So what he, what he told us is, with the five parameter, he can do everything. So that's why sort of this is underlying, kind of, I think this quote gives us some belief to the mathematical biology field. Uh, people, uh, they will success someday uh, by doing this. But I wonder if this is really true. <coughs> because this is critical. If we, if we keep doing with uh, which does not exist, then you spend your whole graduate student life, right? So, uh, oh, yeah. And my laptop is not <laughs> nowadays good. New one is coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> but interesting thing is this laptop knows the punchline. <laughs> so whenever I say try to say important thing, it goes down. So here uh, this was my question. So let's say we have these two oscillating data. So let's assume that we have a freedom for choosing any function f and g. 
So the only restriction is F and G are smooth function. Because in biological system, there is no discontinuity thing. So let's just assume that F and G are general uh, smooth function. That means how many free parameters do we have? You can choose any function. That means there are infinite number of the parameters, right? So then, can we always find a model that perfectly match this data? Second, if the model exists, is this unique? So if you take the ordinary differential equation, what is the most important theorem? Existence and uniqueness theorem, right? So there is a smooth ordinary differential equation. Let's pick up the initial condition. Then there will be only one solution, right? But this is exactly sort of opposite problem. So let me draw something. Then can you find the ordinary differential equation which have this solution? And is this the unique ODE? OK. Uh, according to the von Neumann, it looks like there are a lot, right? We have an infinite number of the parameter, right? Uh, but it turns out no. Uh, let me explain why. So uh, let's say R of t is S of t is, is this uh, time course data. Because this is oscillating data, what we can do is we can always find the two time points where their values are the same. One happen at increasing phase, and another happen at decreasing phase, right? We can always uh, pair the two time points where their values are the same. Let's imagine the sign. There will be always uh, some matching, right? Then what is the definition of this hand map is sending this one time point to the another time point where their values are the same. Here is a hand map. So sending the 22 to the 33 because their values are the same. So we can easily convert the given oscillating time growth data to this hand map. So any question regarding this uh, definition? Make sense? So send the one time point to another time point where their values are the same at the given data. So, so that the domain and ranges are exactly one period of the time course data, that means we can composite these two. So from now, the composition of these two hand map is pi map. OK. So uh, here is a theorem. So what I prove is, after iterating this pi map, if this pi map has a fixed point, then the model does not exist. That means no matter what we choose for f and g, it cannot uh, fit the model. Uh, let me explain with this simple example. Let's assume that pi has a fixed point t0. That means pi is a composition of this hat, s set r hat, so this. Then let's assume that r hat of the t0 is d, t1. Then s set of t1 will be back, be back to the t0 because t0 is a fixed point, right? So now let's imagine what is the definition of the hat map. It sends one time point to another time point where their values are the same, right? So R of T0 and S of T0, S T1, their value will be the same, right? That means if we plug in this to any function f and g, their values will be the same because inputs are the same, right? So now let's assume that the model exists, OK? Then what happened? The right side will be the same at T0 and T1, right? Because f and g are same at t0 and t1. Therefore, left side will be the same. Everything is OK? Then why this is weird? What this tells us is derivative of r, the given data, derivative are same at t0 and t1. But if t0 occur at the rising phase, t1 will occur at falling phase. That means their derivative sign should be opposite positive and negative. So impossible. That means this assumption is wrong. So really, the model does not exist. So which means for this example, pi map has a two fixed point. That means no matter what we use for this function f and g, we cannot reproduce this solution. So this is about the existence. Then what about the uniqueness? Uh, this is necessary sufficient condition for uniqueness. Uh, what I proved is, except for major zero space, uh, uniqueness is guaranteed. Okay. Uh, if we can, I spend three years to find a good model that can reproduce that data, then you're really lucky you got the unique model. 
Okay, that, that's not the one of the many model, okay? Uh, and the proof is actually uh, mainly uh, based on this concept, locally recurrent function. Uh, why I want to emphasize this is, uh, this uh, paper published in 1963 by Solomon Marcus, uh, he, uh, believe it, he's still alive, he's 98, but he's still working. Uh, this paper actually introduced this concept first time. Uh, look at the citation number. And three, and one of three is mine. <laughs> so F, basically this concept was sort of totally forgotten in the mathematical field, but I, found, I think that this is really important concept in this problem. So as you can see, this mathematical biology can give us some new meaning of some mathemat uh, old math, um, give us some new utility of the uh, old mathematical concept. Although we begin with a totally different uh, motivation. So in summary, uh, at least at this example, von Neumann's uh, quote is totally wrong because that means it's really hard to find a model. It's not such easy, okay? Uh, because many <laughs> mathematicians actually attack mathematical biologists using this quote actually. So give me five parameters, I can do whatever. But that's not true, definitely. Uh, so the next question is, I use this special class of the ordinary differential equation. What if a little bit we generalize the function? Then this uh, well position is changed. And what if we have multiple species, not the one-to-one? -one? And what if we use different type of the data? Uh, furthermore, until now I ask, uh, I request the perfect fitting, right? But real life is there is always error. So if we allow the some epsilon range of the fitting. So all of these are open question. And I think, yeah, I found that this is a really difficult problem. So uh, I think smarter people than me should uh, study this, I guess. OK, so, okay, so until now, I talk about the parameter estimation. And next thing is a uh, sort of fun part. So we spent a couple of years, we finally developed the model. Then let's do the analysis and simulation. Let's see the, some results from the model. And here are some, uh, so that due to for simulation, there are various type of numerical method. And for analysis, th these are sort of typical way. Uh, to explain this uh, process, uh, let me bring one example. This, because I said we will see some biology, so we will do it from now. Uh, for the example, uh, I will use this one. So what is a circadian? So circadian comes from the Greek word. Uh, circa is about, dm is a day. So circadian means about a day. So circadian rhythm is rhythms whose period is 24 hours. This is a circadian rhythm. So I don't know, you already recognize, but your body has a lot of circadian rhythm. Uh, here's a, a couple example. So every 9 p.m. in your brain, melatonin secretion starts every day. That means 24-hour period, right? That's why you feel sleepy around this time. And this hormone secretion stops in the morning so that we can wake up, okay? Furthermore, in early morning, our blood pressure shows the sharpest rise. This is one of the reasons most of heart attacks occur around this time. So heart attack does not occur randomly. If you look at the distribution of the heart attack, uh, it mainly focus on this uh, zone. And furthermore, due to this reason, uh, so for a young person, it's okay, but for an old person, uh, when you get up from the bed, sometimes you feel disease. Actually, that is uh, come from uh, this one. Uh, furthermore, now is uh, 5 p.m. It's time we greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength. What this means, now is a good time to go gym, uh, not to sit here. <laughs> so, I, th uh, I don't know, yeah. So this is not a good time for colloquium, so in summary. <laughs> uh, so then, okay, so our bodies do, do this something exact time every day. Then the question is how our body knows the time, right? How do they know what time it is? 
And a couple decades ago, biologists finally found the clock in our brain. Uh, that located in here, which is named the suprachiasmatic nucleus, a uh, very fancy name, but we can call it just a circadian clock. Our brain really has a small zone, looks like this. It generates beautiful 24-hour rhythm until we die. Forever. When we get up, uh, when we, when we born, and until we die, that, it generates a 24-hour rhythm forever. Okay, this rhythm tells the time to the rest of our body. That's why we can wake up at a similar time. And if you go to the some USA or China, then what do you feel? You feel jet lag, right? Why we feel jet lag? Because this internal circadian clock time and outside environmental clock times are conflict. That's why we feel the jet lag. And to adjust this circadian clock to the different time zone, usually it takes the one day per hour. So if we go USA, then 12 hour difference, that means we will need about two weeks to completely adjust our clock to the uh, environmental clock. So uh, let me briefly explain how this uh, circadian uh, rhythm can be generated. So through the last two decades, a lot of people tried to find this simple diagram. You cannot imagine how much money and human resources are spent for this one uh, simple diagram, so please pay attention. <laughs> I think every one thing are one billion, I guess, okay? So uh, this is a, we call repressor gene. So this is a gene in the DNA. And in this promoter, if this activator protein <coughs> binds, the name of this activator is clock. I don't know why they name it that way because it's in the circadian clock, right? So when this activator binds this, uh, uh, in this DNA, what happens is uh, repressor mRNA, messenger RNA are uh, produced. Uh, the name, this is a period, okay? So this is activator protein, this is a repressor mRNA. This messenger RNA can be now converted to the protein, okay? And then this protein form the complex. So throughout this process, what you can imagine, we keep producing something, right? That means repressor protein is going up or down? Going? up, right? The level of the repressor protein is now keep increasing and keep increasing. Then what happens is, uh, it enters the nucleus, they inactivate this activator, so that production stops. Then what do you expect? This increasing stop, now it will decreasing. Okay? So in this way, this rising and falling phase are repetitively happen so that it generates a 24 hours. So this rising phase occurred at 12 hours and decreasing phase at 12 hours. So after finding this transcriptional negative feedback loop, biologists thought that they are done. But I thought that that's not true. The reason is this transcription negative feedback loop exists in any biological system. If, if, you, bring, uh, if you bring me anything, I guarantee there will be the transcription of negative feedback loop. But only some of them can generate the rhythm. Then, because we are in the math department, what this tells us? Transcription of negative feedback loop is necessary condition, but not sufficient condition, right? Okay, but, uh, so that's why I wonder, that means then, what, what condition do we need more? Not only this transcription of negative feedback loop, we needed something more to generate the rhythm. That's what I had in my mind. And uh, as I said, to see this is a good problem or not, don't forget that intersection. That means it should be biologically interesting problem. Uh, I think uh, this is a biologically interesting problem because uh, science selected a 125 question in all nature science field. Uh, we have to solve this century. Uh, one of, oh, <laughs> see, he knows the highlight. <laughs> Indeed, I need a new computer. <laughs> Indeed, uh, how this clock function 
was selected uh, one of the uh, important uh, problem. Uh, but when I show this at the math colloquium, uh, every people does not look at this. Actually, they look at this part, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so to biologists, this is an equally important problem with this conjecture. To them, this was a really serious problem. So I thought that this is a, a good problem for us. So to attack this problem, we have to develop the mathematical model. And there are two approaches. One is a really detailed, realistic model, or a very simple model. So uh, this is my uh, detailed model, which consists of about 200 variables ODE. Uh, I spent uh, three years at the basement of the lab <laughs> to develop this one, and I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but this both approach has pros and cons. This is realistic, but it's really difficult to analyze something. This simple model, to develop the simple model, simplif simplification means we have to cut it out some part of here. That means we give some bias. So uh, there, that's the some cons, but pros is we can do some analysis. So some people say that the simplification of model is not the science, it's art because we do it by our intuition, okay? So, uh, but another pros and cons is, uh, when I give a talk at the biology department, they prefer this. Uh, in the math department, they prefer this. <laughs> so let's go with the, the simple model approach. So here is a, a simple model, uh, which consists of uh, mRNA, the repressor mRNA, and then repressor protein, and then repressor protein in the nucleus, and as I said, this repressor protein binds the activator, then this activator becomes inactive. Sort of this uh, contains every essential of this uh, transcription and negative feedback loop part. And here is an ordinary differential equation, uh, which describes the concentration of the messenger RNA of the repressor and repressor protein and protein in the nucleus. And here I assume that activator is a constant because activator protein level is constant in this clock. So there are parameters, alpha 1, beta 1, blah, blah, then let's put some number. Then what you will see is sometimes it oscillating or sometimes it doesn't. Exactly like a real transcription and negative period loop. As I said, transcription and negative period loop in the real system sometimes generate the rhythm, sometimes doesn't. Okay? So here is a system which behaves exactly like that. Then what do you want to do? We want to know under which condition they generate the rhythm or not, right? So we can do some uh, analysis, come from dynamical system. Uh, we can derive the condition for rhythm generation. Okay. So here is the conclu uh, result. Uh, what we found is the ratio between this repressor concentration and activator is Im important. And this ratio should be between these two numbers to generate the rhythm. Uh, in this way, it, this system can have uh, enough nonlinearity to generate the rhythm. Uh, but if I explain in this way, then biology does not have any idea what's going on here. So uh, let's explain the uh, biological language. What this means is molar ratio between repressor and activator should be around the one to one. So here is the simulation wizard. You can see that. This ratio, molar ratio between repressor and activator should be around the one to one. That means only when the average amount of the repressor and activator are similar, this transcription or negative feedback loop can generate the rhythm. So this is sort of additional condition to generate the rhythm. Okay? So here I want to emphasize two things. Do you think this conclusion can be derived by just looking at this figure? So biologists are usually looking at just this figure, and they try to find some mechanism. Do you think it's possible? It's impossible, really. We need uh, some th uh, serious mathematics to get this conclusion. And second thing I want to emphasize is uh, we have to use biological language when we describe the result. We cannot say the nonlinearity should be greater than 8. Then they will kick, out, kick us out. Okay, so the result is described in the biological language because the next step is experimental confirmation. So we have to ask the experimental lab to test this prediction. So I 
visit the uh, Chugon Lee lab at Florida State University to test this prediction. So we developed this mice. What this mice is, we mutate the brain of the mice. So what we can do is, by changing the concentration of the certain drug, uh, what they're drinking, we can change the molar ratio. Okay? So we can change the really repressor and activator ratio by using this mice. And here is an experimental result. Uh, so this is an activity diagram of the mice. The black dot means they are active, they are wake up. And white reason means they sleep. Okay? So what happens is, when we maintain the one-to-one -one molar ratio, they sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up, like us, with a 24-hour period. But when we increase the molar ratio, here is the pattern. They sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up in chaotic way. That means circadian clock does not work. Indeed, this confirms that our model prediction by using the mathematics, this uh, uh, experiment. Indeed, transcription negative feedback loop is not enough. We need the additional condition. The ratio between repressor and activator should be maintained. Okay? So, this finished the one cycle. Uh, but what usually happens is, if we finish this one cycle and publish the paper, then it usually gives a new question. That's why the hardest part is the first collaboration, but as long as first project succeeds, then it will give another round. So, for instance, for this project, th this gives a new question. Uh, the fact is, in this transcription negative field group, this the production of the mRNA is the most noisy part in the cell. It's really sensitive to the noise. That means this mRNA fluctuating a lot. This is real data. How mRNA, repressor mRNA in the circadian clock change? In one day, the level is 100. Second day, it becomes 30. Because pr usually this protein level proportional to this mRNA. This means this protein level will also fluctuating a lot. But we said that molar ratio is very important. But intrinsically, circadian has molar ratio fluctuation. Then the natural second question is, we know that there, are, there might be molar ratio fluctuation. Then how circadian clock maintain beautiful rhythm until we die? What's going on here? That means something, there is another thing we have to solve. So here was a new question we had. And, in sh and here is a short, uh, short summary of our result. Uh, what we found is uh, network topology is very important. If we look at the circadian clock carefully, there is a core negative feedback loop, but there is also additional feedback loop exist. So we thought that that additional feedback loop play some role. So we compare three design. This is what you saw, core negative feedback loop, single negative feedback loop structure. But what we did is we added additional negative feedback loop here. And we also added additional positive feedback loop here. And that means original system has three differential equations, but here we have additional two more, and here additional two more. So what we did is, uh, this alpha one is a parameter which gives the transcription, which is very uh, noisy and very fluctuating a lot. That means we change a lot. And what we did is we changed this parameter, and we compare how much molar ratio change in these three systems. And the result was very surprising, because very different. Uh, what this result tells us is, when we change this alpha one, this negative negative feedback loop design shows the least change in molar ratio. But positive negative feedback loop is worst. So this is a good design, right? Because it can maintain the one to one molar ratio. So as a re uh, that means uh, this, uh, with this design, we can prevent the fluctuation of the molar ratio, although mRNA level change. So as a result, when we change the parameter, this negative negative feedback loop design has the largest uh, reason where the rhythm occurs, so that it can generate over a wide range of the condition. But positive negative feedback loop has worst, uh, worst. It has the narrowest range. But we had a really hard time to publish this work. This simulation is done. Actually, I proof. And in math, proof is everything. But in here, uh, actually not enough. Uh, the reason was, uh, there, uh, this is one of paper, but there are many, some nature, PNAs, lots of papers showing the exactly opposite result. 
So we just claim that positive negative feedback loop design is good, negative negative feedback loop design is worst. <laughs> so we claim exactly opposite thing. We, we, because we show that this is under specific condition, but if you look at some math bio textbook, you will see this kind of sentence. This is sort of well established fact. So that's why although we proved we had a hard time to convince the, our field. So in math biology then, the other option is, okay, let's show it with the experiment. Okay, so this is a motivation for this uh, new study. So we use the synthetic biology. What is the synthetic biology? Uh, if we have electronic circuit diagram, you know, uh, your smart co uh, colleagues can generate this electronic circuit, right? What synthetic biology allow us is, let's say we want to make this topology network. Then they can make real, uh, engineer the circuit inside of the bacteria, okay? So uh, I asked uh, my collaborator, Matthew Bennett, let's test this. So he uh, made this structure by using this network topology. So when we put this uh, engineer the circuit inside of bacteria, first, they generate a beautiful rhythm, as you can see here. Indeed, uh, they generate the rhythm, but the period is not the 24 hour, but uh, they generate the rhythm with the two hour or th uh, three hour period. So, now we have a system which is oscillating. What do you want to test? I want to test that this additional negative feedback loop is important, right? So what we did is we removed this additional positive feedback loop or additional negative feedback loop. So when we remove the additional positive feedback loop, nothing happened. So lots of math, math bio textbook claim that additional positive feedback loop is important, but really nothing happened. But when we remove the additional negative feedback loop, what happened is after a couple of rhythms, rhythm's gone. That means it's really unstable system. Additional negative feedback loop is really important to stabilize the system. So this confirms that this negative negative feedback loop design is a key design to generate the stable rhythm. Okay, so uh, here's the summary. So there is a process of the, uh, how mathematician can help biologists. And furthermore, another important message from here is there are a lot of open problems for mathematicians. So not, o not all math biologists need to work with the biologist. So there are many things you can, uh, we can do. For instance, uh, uh, here are a couple of things we can do. First is, uh, shows the utility of the tool in your field. It could be algebra, topology, geometry, or whatever. Just, you don't need to develop the new tool. Just showing existing tool can be used in the biology is really appreciate. And second is, uh, due to this short history of the mathematical biology, there are many tools, widely used tools, which fundamental mathematical validation is still not done. So if you have an interest in there are many open problems you can attack. Uh, furthermore, third thing is you can work with the biologist to answer some biological puzzles. So there are uh, various uh, ways uh, we can do. Uh, here are people whom I want to thank uh, here are those are people I have uh, worked together uh, until now who involved in all this project. Uh, thanks for your attention.